Tonight, that escaped killer now in custody in Pennsylvania after a tense nearly two-week manhunt. Police posing for a photo with Danilo Cavalcante finally captured 14 days after he crab-walked out of prison. How authorities picked up his trail and the photos just out, the police dog that ultimately pinned him down, and his new mugshot. Also tonight, Hurricane Lee closing in. The new hurricane and tropical storm watches just issued for much of the New England coast. North Korea's Kim Jong-un and Russia's Vladimir Putin holding a rare summit. What they want from each other and more of my interview with Iran's president. We ask, is Iran supplying Russia drones to use in Ukraine? The catastrophic floods in Libya, the death toll now topping 8,000 and fears it will soar even higher. Mitt Romney making a major announcement about his future in the Senate. The body cam causing outrage in Seattle. The officer appearing to joke about a woman killed by a police car. The cruise ship running aground in Greenland. More than 200 people on board. The race now to free it. And the new space record for an American astronaut. How he broke it by accident. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. It took 14 days, hundreds of members of law enforcement and multiple sightings. But the fugitive killer who escaped prison and numerous attempts to corner him has finally been caught. This was the scene early this morning in Pennsylvania. Danilo Cavalcante in police custody once again. The two-week manhunt unfolding in chilling images. His daring escape from prison, crab walking up and out. His dramatically changed appearance on a doorbell camera days later. And now this, dirty, bloodied, and in handcuffs. The details of his capture playing out like a crime thriller. Surveillance planes overhead, thermal imaging cameras, a sudden storm almost spoiling his arrest, and to top it off, a hero dog. George Solis has been on the story since the very beginning, and he starts us off tonight. Tonight, a tense 14-day manhunt is finally over. Shortly after 8 a.m., our suspect was captured. After an exhaustive search, escape killer Daniello Cavalcante is back in police custody. Our nightmare is finally over. The dramatic series of events happening overnight. A DEA aircraft with thermal imaging picked up a heat source, but then was forced to leave during severe weather. So tactical teams closed in to secure the area and hours later moved in. Cavalcante did not realize he was surrounded until that had occurred. That did not stop him from trying to escape. He began to crawl through thick underbrush, taking his rifle with him as he went. Authorities say as he tried to escape, it was a canine that took him down. Seen here in this photo, the canine identified as Yoda by Customs and Border Protection. He continued to resist, but was uh, forcibly taken into custody. No shots were fired. Word quickly spreading on police radio. I'm proud to announce the subject is in custody. Beating subject is in custody. Store manager Jim Martin saw Cavalcante being taken away. We watched him basically walk him up. One um, camouflage trooper had his gun, his rifle. Officers on the scene posing for this picture with a handcuffed Cavalcante. They're not doing anything to demean him or harm him in any way there. They've handled him well since he was taken into custody. Um, I'm proud of them and their work. The manhunt started when the elusive Cavalcante was seen crab walking out of prison. He was spotted multiple times over the next two weeks, including this doorbell video where he tried to get in contact with a former co-worker. Then he stole and ditched a van, then managed to steal a rifle and ammo while on the run. Tonight, a community relieved. I feel like a weight is off my shoulders. A lot safer, definitely, just because he was in our backyard. The family of Jebba Brandau, the ex-girlfriend Cavalcante, was convicted of murdering, releasing a statement saying in part they were deeply grateful for the support and hard work by authorities. No one in the community was harmed and no law enforcement officer was harmed either. So that's, that's really, that's the win. And George, I understand we're starting to get some details now on how Cavalcante survived while on the run. 
Yeah, that's right, Lester. In an interview post-arrest, Cavalcante admitted to authorities he survived in these woods by eating watermelon from a nearby farm, moved mainly around at night, and planned to use that stolen 22 rifle to carjack someone to break the police perimeter in the next 24 hours. Lester. All right, George Solis starting us off. Thanks. Another major story we are following. Hurricane watches and tropical storm watches have now been issued for much of the New England coast as Hurricane Lee closes in. Meteorologist Bill Karens is tracking it. What are you looking at? Uh, good evening, Lester. We know Saturday morning, Hurricane Lee will be entering the Gulf of Maine. The forecast isn't for a very intense storm, but a huge storm with a very large wind field way away from the center of the storm. So hurricane watches go from Portland to Bar Harbor all the way to Eastport. We have tropical storm watches from Portland southwards all the way down to areas of Rhode Island. We're concerned mostly with the wind. We have a lot of leaves on the trees. We're going to have winds 50 to 70 mile per hour on the coastal areas, and that is going to be an issue with knocking down trees and power outages. And then the storm surge. If we get that storm Storm surge towards high tide Saturday right around noon. It could be as high as two to four feet, especially in Cape Cod Bay and out on Cape Cod. Bill, thanks. Overseas, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un having a rare meeting today with Vladimir Putin in Russia amid U.S. concerns that the North will supply arms to Russia for the war in Ukraine. We get the latest from Richard Engel. Kim Jong-un has never been needed like this or courted by his powerful neighbor, Russian President Vladimir Putin, who was on hand to greet him personally. Their handshake lasting nearly a minute after the North Korean dictator arrived in Russia on his armored train. Thank you for having us, despite being very busy, Kim said. Kim was given a personal tour by Putin of the Vistochny Cosmodrome, Russia's version of Cape Canaveral. Showing off Russian high tech, Putin said he hoped Russia could help Kim advance North Korea's space program. But U.S. officials believe this was all cover for a deal. Russia sharing technology for North Korean missiles? with North Korea giving Putin badly needed artillery to bomb Ukraine. Kim promised his unconditional support for Putin and the war, wishing Russia a great victory in its sacred struggle. Putin toasting to the health of the comrade chairman. The United States has tried to isolate Russia and North Korea. Both of its leaders are under sanctions. Today, you could hardly tell. This summit could never have taken place without approval from China, which is emerging as the real powerhouse in this three-way alliance, with Russia dependent on China for economic support and now on North Korea for weapons. Lester. Richard Engel, thank you. Last night, we brought you portions of my exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Iran's president, Ibrahim Raisi. Tonight, we have more specifically, I pressed the president about complaints from the U.S. and Ukraine that Iran is supplying Russia with drones. Let me turn to the issue of uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia and drones. Can you be as clear as you can about what Iran's military relationship is with Russia right now, especially as it pertains to drones, Iranian drones? We have connections with different uh, countries, economic relations, trade relations with Russia. We have a trade and economic relations. We have defensive relations and defense cooperation. We had and we have no role in Russia, Ukraine war. Ukraine claims it's it shot down perhaps two dozen Iranian-made drones. They have recovered wreckage and linked it to Iran. Do you discount that, what, what the U.S. calls, uh, I think, undeniable proof? I followed this issue and I had some conversations with Eastern Europe uh, officials. I asked Ukraine if they have any documents they should provide with us. Till now, they have failed in providing any documents with us regarding Iran's role in delivery of the weaponry to the Ukrainian war by Iran. More from my conversation with Iran's president. The death toll is rising from the catastrophic flooding in Libya. More than 8,000 people dead and thousands more missing after entire neighborhoods were swept out to sea. Molly Hunter now on the desperate search. Tonight, the Libyan Navy pulling bodies out of the sea, struggling against the surf in the coastal city of Derna. 
Late today, helicopters joining the recovery effort. The massive flooding in eastern Libya has claimed more than 8,000 lives, according to Libyan authorities. The exact toll unclear, an additional 10,000 people still missing. This man shouting, my sister, her sons, her daughter and granddaughter. 11 people in his family, all dead, he says. Disaster in every sense of the word. Over the weekend, Storm Daniel brought nine months of rain in just six hours, bursting through two dams. Satellite images show the coastline before and after. Drone footage captures the scale, one-third of Derna wiped out. This resident saying bodies have been buried in mass graves. The cemeteries are all full. This man in neighboring Egypt, distraught, he lost four members of his family. Humanitarian aid now coming into the country too slowly and years of chaos, division and war have left the country vulnerable. Tonight, the U.N. says more than 30,000 people have been displaced from their homes. Molly Hunter, NBC News. We'll take a turn now to Washington. The White House today slamming the decision by House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to open an impeachment inquiry against President Biden, with McCarthy today defending the move. Peter Alexander is at the White House. Mr. President, President Biden tonight not responding to shouted questions about the House Republicans' new impeachment inquiry, as Speaker Kevin McCarthy is defending his decision to move forward. An impeachment inquiry is simply empowering the House to a greater level to get the documents they need to answer questions. House Republicans are investigating whether President Biden profited off the foreign business dealings of his son Hunter and other family members, but have not yet found any direct evidence. The White House says the president did nothing wrong. It's a political stunt, uh, and it is going after the president politically, uh, not about the truth. Tonight, Democrats argue McCarthy's move is intended to satisfy his party's most conservative members, but some are still threatening his speakership. This is a baby step following weeks of pressure from House conservatives to do more. After promising a vote, McCarthy ordered the inquiry on his own, noting Democrats did the same thing against former President Trump. Nancy Pelosi changed the president of this House. Why would it have to be different today? Peter, let me ask you about another major headline we're following tonight. Senator Mitt Romney announcing he won't run for re-election. What's that all about? Lester, that announcement coming as a surprise today. Romney saying he would be in his mid-80s at the end of his next term and that it's time for a new generation of leaders. He has been an outspoken critic of former President Trump, now the Republican presidential frontrunner, and Romney likely would have faced a tough primary. Lester. Peter, thank you. We're just one day away from what could be a crippling strike for the U.S. auto industry. Both sides are making clear they are ready for what could be a first-of-its-kind walkout at all big three automakers at once. Jesse Kirsch is at the Detroit Auto Show and brings us more. With less than 30 hours until their contracts expire, tonight the United Auto Workers at the big three are getting ready to walk off the job. If we don't have a fair contract by midnight on Thursday night, we will strike. A strike looming from union halls outside Detroit to a plant in Kokomo, Indiana. Me and my wife, we struggle. We try to make ends meet to take care of our four kids. The union demanding a 46% pay raise compounded over four years plus better benefits. Late today, UAW President Sean Fain said GM, Ford, and Stellantis are now offering between 17 and 20 percent pay raises over four years. I go on strike for anything to make sure that the, the folks that are coming in after me are going to have a, a livable wage and a, a future. Like this was a career when I first started, and now it's just a job. According to CNBC data, for U.S. based auto workers, labor costs Tesla an estimated $45 an hour. Foreign automakers pay $55 to $60 an hour, but the big three shell out as much as $67 an hour. How much longer can union labor for your company be sustainable when you look at what other manufacturers are doing? We bet on America. We bet on the UAW. We believe that this is the right bet. Ford CEO says his company isn't backing down. We're absolutely ready for a strike. The UAW says a strike will be what it calls a stand-up strike, where just a portion of its roughly 146,000 big three auto workers walk off the job at specific facilities. The impact could be just as great as if you shut down the entire company, because if there are no engines, no transmissions, that essentially shuts down final assembly. 
All right, Jesse, joining me now from the Detroit Auto Show. Jesse, there is more to this strategy of a targeted strike. Can you explain? Yeah, Lester, a stand-up strike would limit how many workers get strike pay. That could make the UAW's money last longer and, as a result, drag out a strike. Lester? Jesse Kirsch, thank you. In just 60 seconds, outrage after a police officer on body camera apparently saying alarming things about a woman killed by police and the cruise ship running aground. How long until help arrives? Outrage is growing following the release of police body cam video. In it, an officer appears to be joking about a student killed after she was hit by a Seattle police cruiser. Tonight, what her family is now saying. Steve Patterson reports. But she is dead. Tonight, anger simmering in Seattle over what appears to be an officer's <laughs> callous laughter in a disregard for human life. Seattle police releasing uh, body cam sure, video uh, of Officer Daniel Otterer, who appears to be yeah, making yes. light of the death of John V. Kandula, hours after she was struck and killed by another officer's squad car in January. I think she went up on the hood, hit the windshield, then when he hit the brakes, flew off the car. Kandula, a 23-year-old grad student, was crossing the street when she was struck by a patrol car, reportedly going more than 60 in a 25-mile-an-hour zone, responding to a call. It does not seem like there's a criminal investigation going on. Otterer, who serves as vice president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild, was That's on the phone with person. Guild President Mike Salon, recorded on body cam. Only yeah. Otterer's portion of the call is audible, but later he appears to joke about settling with the victim's family. Yeah, just write a check. Yeah, <laughs> $11,000. She was 26 anyway. She had limited value. I was appalled. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Um, anger, rage, so many emotions. Seattle police say the video was discovered by an employee who became concerned <laughs> after hearing the audio and flagged it to department brass. In a statement, the family says every human life is invaluable and should not be belittled, especially during a tragic loss. Otterer and the Seattle Police Guild have yet to respond to our request for comment. SPD's accountability office is investigating the body cam to see if any policies were violated. Separately, King County's prosecuting office is reviewing the crash itself. Lester. All right, Steve Patterson, thank you. Still ahead tonight, a luxury cruise liner grounded the race to free it. And now this reports of COVID on board. We're back now with a developing story. A luxury cruise ship with fares as high as $33,000 is stuck in the freezing Arctic with more than 200 people on board. And now there is word of a possible COVID outbreak as passengers wait to be rescued. Rahema Ellis has late details. Tonight, failed attempts to free the Danish cruise ship Ocean Explorer with 206 passengers and crew on board. Now more help is on the way. The ship ran aground in a dazzling, rugged stretch of Northeast Greenland National Park. Officials say low tide Monday morning made it impossible for the ship to sail on its own. The crew reportedly offloaded the anchor, and they're floating the lifeboats to lighten the load, and one attempt to tow the ship failed. Another vessel is not expected to arrive until Friday, or Arctic Command says high tide may free the ship before then. In a statement, ship authorities said all passengers, the expedition team and crew aboard are safe and well. There is no immediate danger to themselves or the surrounding environment. The Sydney Morning Herald reports Australians Gina Hill and Stephen Fraser are on board. Fraser said he and several others have contracted COVID, adding there's a doctor on board, also saying it's a little bit frustrating, but we are in a beautiful part of the world. We're sitting right near the glacier when we open our window. Tonight, passengers waiting for help to set sail on the trip of a lifetime. Rahema Ellis, NBC News. When we come back, an American astronaut's record-breaking year-long trip to space, how it happened by accident. Sunset start to the mission. Finally tonight, a record-breaking trip to space for an American astronaut now they're nearly a year, but as Sam Brock reports, his history-making space odyssey wasn't actually planned. And you see uh, Frank Rubio on the right. As far as records go. Having an opportunity uh, to say goodbye one final time. When American astronaut Frank Rubio set off on his mission to space last September, he wasn't planning on breaking any. And liftoff, a sunset start to the mission of Rubio. 
But a trip to the ISS, scheduled for six months, required an astronomical audible when the spacecraft sprang a leak. The trip now breaking an American record of 355 days. It was unexpected. In some ways, it's been uh, an incredible challenge, uh, but in other ways, it's been an incredible blessing. A new spacecraft won't return this crew until late September at the earliest, meaning not only have they counted off all the major holidays. A happy Thanksgiving. Happy holidays! But Rubio will become the first American in space for more than a calendar year. He exercises two hours a day, conducts experiments and video conferences with his family, but missed his now college-age son heading off to West Point. As much as it was a challenge for me as a father to miss all those things, it was also a pretty proud moment to see um, Deb and the kids just uh, thrive and overcome. From 250 miles above, Rubio has a message that still holds great gravity. There's very few things in life that we accomplish individually, and almost everything uh, big that we accomplish as humanity requires incredible teamwork. From Earth, Sam Brock, NBC News. That's nightly news for this Wednesday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.